Welcome to NeuroFest. I'm excited to be here and tell you a little bit about the work that we've done in my lab and with colleagues around the world really looking at the mechanisms of attention and working memory, both in typical brains and in people with a variety of different disorders. I'm actually going to start with a little video that I got from YouTube of a card trick that will just sort of set up some of the issues. Hi, I'm Richard, this is Sarah, and we're going to perform the amazing color-changing card trick with this blue-backed deck of cards. Now the idea is very simple. I'm just going to spread the cards in front of Sarah and ask her to push any card towards the camera. Right, okay, let's see. I'm going to go for this card here. Okay. Now Sarah could have selected any card at all from the deck but she selected the card which is now face down on the table. What I'm going to ask her to do is show us which card she selected. Right, so the card that I chose was in fact the Three of Diamonds. The Three of Diamonds, okay, excellent choice. That card goes back into the deck. Now I'm just going to spread the cards face up on the table. Do a little click of the fingers and you'll see that Sarah's card here has now got a blue back. Not particularly surprising, what's slightly more surprising is all of the other cards have got red backs. And that is the amazing color changing card trick. But wait, it's not actually about the cards. Four things changed. Shirt colors change, background color change, the desk color change. All of those things change while you were watching the video. Did you notice any of those changes? No, so not only did they do the card trick, but they did another trick with your mind. Okay, and if you want, you can find this on YouTube and they have a little explanation. They actually show you a bigger camera view of the whole room so you can see how they changed all of those things while you were watching the video. Okay, question for you. I assume you didn't detect those changes. Is that due to a failure of attention or due to a failure of memory? How many people think it was a problem with your attention? How many think it was a problem with your memory? A few? Well, the correct answer is yes. It's a problem with attention and memory because they work together. So we're going to talk about attention and we're going to talk about a particular kind of memory called working memory that's related to something you might have heard of called short-term memory. So attention should be familiar to you, right? It's the ability to focus your resources on what you're trying to do, like reading this book, and filter out distractions like the dog barking and the obnoxious person next to you talking on the cell phone. Working memory is a little less familiar, but you use this at least 100,000 times a day. And that's the uh, system that you use to temporarily store stuff just for a second or two in order to do the various tasks that you're trying to do. It's not a long-term memory that sticks around for hours or days. It's just there for a few seconds. Okay, these are related mental and biological processes. So attention has a big impact on what we store in working memory. But working memory stores the goals that we have and therefore controls what we attend to. So they're densely interactive. Studying one without the other is really hard. It's like studying the heart and the lungs, right? They're separate organs, they're separate systems, but they constantly work together. So let's talk a little bit about how attention works. And to really understand attention, you have to understand competition. Attention really deals with competition between different things that you might look at or different thoughts that might be at your head. So, very simple thing. Look at the middle of the screen, try to perceive the house. Easy enough? Okay, continue looking at the center of the screen and try not to perceive the house. Right? You just can't help it, you, you see the house. There's nothing competing with it, and so you have to perceive it. We do the same thing with a face, so try to perceive this face. Easy enough. Try not to perceive the face, right? You can't do it. If you're looking in the middle of the screen, you're perceiving the face. Now we're going to blend the face and the house together. So now, try to perceive the face as clearly as you can. While you're doing that, the house 
fades away. Or try to perceive the house now, and if you're really perceiving the house clearly, the face fades away. So when you put the face and house in competition, now attention has a chance to boost up one thing and filter out the other. So we have competition between the face and the house. That gives us the opportunity to use our attention. Now I want to introduce to you a little bit of neuroscience. This is a sort of schematic version of the basic circuit underlying attention in your brain. So you have a group of neurons in an area called the fusiform face area that respond to faces and help you identify faces. You have another group of neurons in an area called the parahippocampal place area that responds to houses and allows you to, to tell the difference between one house and another. And so when you have this combined stimulus coming in, you're getting some activity in these neurons that code faces, some activity in the neurons that co code houses. But the key is that there's an inhibitory connection between the face neurons and the house neurons. So if you activate faces, it suppresses the houses. Similarly, activating the houses suppresses the faces. Now, if you're attending to them equally, they're both kind of suppressing back and forth, and you get this image that kind of goes back and forth and is hard to see. But if I tell you, hey, attend to the face, you're going to boost up the input to that face area. And that's going to make this response stronger. And in addition to making that response stronger, it's going to increase the inhibition that you get from the faces to the houses, which is going to weaken the houses. Well, what that means is now the houses are responding less strongly, so they can't inhibit the faces as well. So that boosts up the faces even more, making them so they can really now inhibit the houses, and now the houses are totally inhibited, so they don't interfere with the faces. So this cycle continues, and it happens within a couple tenths of a second. This is how attention works by means of competition. So you boost up one thing a little bit, that indirectly increases the inhibition of the other things that you're trying to ignore, and voila, you have attention. Now, if we just have the face, and you say, well, I want to attend to the face, well, you already have a strong representation of the face. Boosting it doesn't do much. If we have the house, and you're trying to attend face, it's also hard not it's hard to block out the house because we don't have much input into the face neurons, so we don't have the face neurons being able to inhibit the house representation. So when you don't have the competition between the face and the house, you can't block out the house. Merely wanting to see a face is not enough. It's overwhelmed by the house representation. So, in general, we find it hard to ignore something unless there's something competing with it that we're attending to. And you might notice this in your everyday life. You might, in fact, notice that you can filter better when there are distractors present. You can filter better when you're actually a little bit overloaded. Not too overloaded, but a little overloaded. So we can filter out the house better when we're attending to a face that's simultaneously present. Or in the real world, imagine you're doing some homework and there's a TV on in the corner. It's really hard to ignore that TV because there's not much competition. But instead of trying to do your homework at home with one TV on, if you go to a crowded coffee shop and there are all kinds of voices and stuff, now you can actually focus better. And a lot of people find they can work best in a crowded coffee shop where there's lots of overload and that help actually helps us focus better. Now, some people find it really easy to work in a coffee shop, others don't. So there are some individual differences there. But the general point is that we can filter better when we're overloaded than when there's only one thing there and we don't have good competition. Now, some things are better competitors than other. So if you are a middle school or high school student and you're trying to focus on your algebra and there's a TV over here, the TV is a much more powerful attractor of attention than algebra is. Okay, so it's hard to filter out the TV when you're trying to study your algebra. However, if you're trying to attend to the uh, the to, or, to or, sorry, it's hard to attend to the algebra when the TV is there. Uh, but it's easy to attend to the TV and filter out the algebra. So strong things 
automatically capture your attention and it's really hard to filter them out. And people who have trouble with filtering, people who have deficits of attention, have particular problems filtering out things that are very potent, things that are loud, things that are intrinsically interesting, things that are intrinsically rewarding. So for me, if there's chocolate on the counter, nothing else can get my attention. OK, let's show you a little example of this from a laboratory task. You know, you can't really take this sort of thing and understand what's going on mechanistically. Right? To really understand this, you have to pull it up into its parts and study it in the laboratory. So here's an example of a classic laboratory task, almost 100 years old, that we can use to study the ability to filter out things that are very strong. So one thing that is very strong in all or most of you is seeing a word and generating the name of that word. So when you see the word red, it's hard not to say in your head, red. Okay? Now notice each one of these words is drawn in a particular color. The original experiments were done on cards and they were drawn in ink. So we call that the ink color. And notice that the ink color is different from the word name. So we, here we have yellow ink and it's the word red. But if we ask you to just read the words, it's not that hard. So let's all do that together. Let's just read these words ignoring the color of the ink. Red, blue, green, green, blue, yellow, red, yellow, yellow, red, blue, yellow, green, blue, red, green. OK, so your brain has a very strong reading response. Now we're going to make it a little more difficult. I'm going to put those up again. And now I want you to name the color of the ink, ignoring what the word is. OK, and I want you to try to do this as quickly, as accurately as you can. So let's all do it together. Are you ready? Yellow, green, red, blue, yellow, green, blue, red, red, green, blue. I give up. OK. So you just had the experience there of struggling to use your attention to overcome what we call a prepotent response. Okay, that is where attention gets difficult. Now, if you put somebody in an MRI scanner and record their brain activity, a bunch of the brain becomes activated when you're trying to do this version of the task. So the regular task, your brain is kind of doing it pretty easily. Once you have to, to name the ink color and ignore the words, you have to activate and recruit all these different brain regions. OK, that's attention. Now let's shift to working memory. So that's your ability to temporarily store the information you need to do the cognitive tasks that you're doing. Here's my favorite example of uh, a working memory task. OK, so add those numbers together in your head. So what did you get? What's the answer? OK, who wants to tell me the steps they went through to get that answer? So 2 plus 7 equals 9. 9 plus 6 equals 15. Where is the 9? But where is it? It's in your heads, right? It's in working memory. So working memory is not really a memory system per se. It's just a temporary buffer that we use to store things that we need to momentarily know. And then that gets discarded, and then we move on to the next thing. OK, so we're constantly storing information without even being aware of it in this brief memory system and using that to help us do our tasks. So that's an example that's sort of in the math and verbal domain. It's hard to study things like that in the laboratory. It's much easier to study visual tasks. So you've probably done these kind of spot the difference things. So you know, you look over here, you look over there. They look like they're the same scene, but there are some differences, right? Have you found some differences between the two scenes? Well, the way that you do that is, for example, you might look at this little bit of the scene here, this picture, and then you look over here, and oh, that, that's different. Well, how do you know it's different? Well, you stored briefly a little memory of this. You moved your eyes over here, compared that memory with now what you're seeing, and you go, that's different. OK, so that's working memory in vision. And you're using that all the time, approximately 100,000 times per day. 
OK, working memory has two key properties. One that I've already kind of mentioned is that it maintains information over short periods of time. The other is that it has a very limited storage capacity. You can't store this entire scene in your working memory and then compare it with that scene. You just don't have the capacity. So let me show you a little example of this. So here's a scene. You're looking at it, and I take it away. OK, you have some information in memory, but now I'm going to show you the same scene, but it's been altered. Can anybody see what's different about this version of the scene versus the previous one? OK, it's hard. I'll go back. So here are the two versions of the scene. OK, if you're going to fly in this plane, this is something you would definitely want to have in the plane. OK, so this jet, oops, so the, uh, the jet engine comes and goes. OK, so you do not have enough working memory capacity to store every element of that scene to retain it just over that brief pause. OK, so you're going to miss things if you're just reliant on your working memory. Now, it's hard to do this in the lab and really get at the mechanism. So we've developed a, a simplified task um, that you already got a little preview of um, called a change detection task. So two colored squares are going to appear very briefly. They're going to be up for about the amount of time that your eyes usually linger on something before moving on. You're constantly moving your eyes around a scene. So about three or four or even five times a second, the visual input is changing as your eyes are moving. So we're going to simulate that by giving you a very brief presentation. It's going to go away and it's going to come back. And one of the two colors will have changed. And I just want you to see, can you tell which color has changed? Here we go. OK, you got that one over there? So that's not so hard. We gave you two very simple objects to remember. That's within your storage capacity. So you should be able to do that. Now we're going to make it a little harder. I'm going to give you four colored squares briefly, take them away, put them back, see if you can detect the change in color. Here we go. How many of you got it? OK, so this item in the lower left, Went from purple to green. OK, so if you got both of those, you're probably feeling pretty good about yourself, right? <laughs> but that's just four simple items. Now let's do it with 12. Oh. OK, you ready? Here we go. <laughs> How many of you got it? Few people got it, OK? I'm going to go back to the previous scene, see if you can get it. Okay, it's at the top. OK, so that's hard. By doing this task, various versions of this over and over, we can actually estimate for an individual person how many objects they can store in their working memory. Now, I said before, attention plays a big role in what gets into working memory. And you'll see that in the next example that I don't even have to explain. Right? So motion grabs your attention, you store the object in working memory, and then you notice the change. OK, so that's how we look at working memory in the laboratory. But why should we look at working memory for simple colored squares? What does that have to do with anything? Well, it turns out that your ability to do this very simple task is correlated with your ability to do much more complex tasks. So this has been done in a variety of different ways. Here's one data set. Each point here represents one of 176 people that we tested. The x-axis here shows what that person's storage capacity is as measured in the task that we just looked at. The y-axis is what that person's score was on a broad test of cognitive ability. It's much like an IQ test. And you can see that the people who score well in terms of their working memory storage capacity also score well in terms of their overall cognitive ability. In fact, a former grad student of mine actually did this using an IQ test. And he found that people who do better on this simple colored square test have a higher IQ. So by studying these simple laboratory phenomena, we hope to understand why it is that some people do better on tests of cognitive ability than others. And the basic idea is that the more things you can keep simultaneously active in your mind, 
the easier it is to do complex tasks because a lot of those tasks require comparing multiple things and, and that sort of thing. Okay, so that's the basic phenomenology of working memory. What about the underlying neuroscience? Well, here's the basic neural circuit underlying working memory. You've got a neuron here that starts responding because of a sensory input. And it sends its output to this neuron, neuron B over here, which then starts responding. And then that one sends its output back to the first neuron, causing this neuron to respond again, which causes this one to respond, which causes this one to respond, and it just keeps going, like the Energizer Bunny, right? And you can keep a, a neural circuit active for several seconds with this kind of feedback circuit. So this is the fundamental circuit that allows us to remember information for a few seconds. Now once you briefly stop the information for even a tenth of a second, it's gone. Once the neurons stop firing, this is gone. Okay, so how can we see this in humans? So in laboratory animals, we can actually go in and record the activity of individual neurons. Tim Hanks will be telling you about that sort of thing in the next talk. What can we do in humans? Well, we can put electrodes on the surface of the head. We can actually record brain activity from electrodes on the skin. A small amount of that electrical activity of the brain percolates through the skull and makes it through the skin to our electrodes. And if we do that, we can do this task, have say set size three, and we can see a signal here that is sustained over time. So this is the signal that we get from these scalp electrodes during this delay period. Subjects are holding three items in memory during this delay period, sorry, um, and we can see that sustained neural activity. If we went farther in time, if we disrupted per the person, if we briefly interrupted them, this would go away completely, it'd be gone. So it's very fragile, but it gives us the ability to hold information for a second or two. Now, if this really reflects the memory, what, what we should find is that if we give people more than three items, if we give somebody five items, it really shouldn't get any bigger because people can't store more than about three items. So in fact, when we go to five items, we get about the same size response. But if they only have to store one item, which is much easier, requires many fewer neurons, what we find is that it's much smaller. In fact, we can predict an individual person's working memory capacity by measuring the signal and asking at what point, at what set size, does it saturate. Okay, I'm going to finish up here talking a little bit about uh, impairments in attention and working memory. And in particular, I'm going to talk about schizophrenia, which is the disorder that I've done the most work on. Schizophrenia is a really important disorder to understand. It only impacts 1 to 2 percent of people in this country, but it's a terrible disorder. It's as expensive or more expensive for our nation than cancer. Okay, because it impacts people beginning early in adulthood and impacts their entire life. And not only does it impact that person, all of their friends, their family members. So we really want to understand schizophrenia. Now, if you know anything about schizophrenia, you probably think of it as hallucinations and de delusions and disorganized thought. Those are the most sort of salient characteristics of schizophrenia. However, there's also impairments in basic cognitive functions, like attention and working memory. And it turns out that the degree of impairment in those basic cognitive functions is a much better predictor of long-term outcome than are the degree of hallucinations, delusions, and thought disorder. So we really want to understand the impairments of attention and working memory so that we can treat them because that's going to have an impact in the long term. And current drugs that treat schizophrenia they impact the thought disorder, the hallucinations, the delusions, but they do not treat the deficits of attention and working memory. So this is an important target for the development of new treatments. Here's an example of uh, something that uh, I got from the internet that is very characteristic of what you might get from somebody with schizophrenia. I remember one day when I got caught in the rain. Each drop felt like an electric shock, and I found it hard to move because of how intense and painful the feeling was. So reports like this have led to an idea, a hypothesis that's been around for about 70 years, that there's an impairment of attentional filtering in people with schizophrenia. They're flooded with information, and they can't focus on one thing and filter out other things. 
Well, about 20 years ago, I started researching this with uh, a clinical psychologist named Jim Gold at the Maryland Psychiatric Research Center. And what we've discovered over the last 20 years is that this is actually in some ways the opposite of what's going on in schizophrenia. So we've developed what we call the hyperfocusing hypothesis. What we find is that these people with schizophrenia have an unusually narrow but intense focusing of their cognitive processing resources. They focus in, they hyper focus. As a result, when we give them this task and ask them to remember four colored squares, they remember many fewer items than control subjects do. So they focus on a small number of the items in working memory. If we ask them to do a task where they're attending either to the face or to the house, the patients actually focus better than the control subjects do. We can tell that by putting them in an MRI scanner, looking at this part of the brain that codes faces, the fusiform face area. If we ask control subjects to attend to the faces or attend to the houses, well, you get some effect, stronger activity in this face area when they're attending to faces than when they're attending to houses. But you put somebody with schizophrenia in the scanner, they have a huge difference. They can really boost up the signal when they're attending to faces, and when they're attending to faces, they really suppress the response to houses. It's hard to know what the underlying neural circuitry is, but we have a hypothesis, and it's about the, the relative activation of two different neurotransmitter receptors, the D1 and D2 dopamine receptors. Okay, but what about these reports where it seems like these people are unable to filter? Well, if you think about it, this is really hyper-focusing. This is somebody who is hyper-focusing on the drops of rain. So it appears that what happens in people with schizophrenia is they hyperfocus, but not necessarily on what's most relevant. They'll focus on the feeling of the rain instead of walking across the street and not getting hit by a car. So our hyperfocusing hypothesis is actually perfectly consistent with these behavioral reports. Okay, just to summarize, what have we learned? So attention is all about boosting up signals and using competition to inhibit the things that we're trying to suppress. And we have sort of a basic neural circuit for that. Working memory has a short duration, but a limited storage capacity. And we have a fundamental neural circuit for that. Schizophrenia involves impairments in basic low-level cognitive processes that are really important for long-term outcomes, things like hospitalizations or employment. And we believe that this is reflecting, at least in part, this hyper-focusing of their processing resources so they can store fewer items in working memory and they get really focused in on things that might be irrelevant. With that, I will finish up and I want to thank you for your attention. And we have some time for questions. Yes, sir. Does uh, dementia open the door for a mild patient? So the question is, what happens in dementia? What happens to attention in dementia? And um, I don't, do you have any? Uh, so dementia isn't my area. So dementia is, is you know, initially sort of associated with memory problems, but there are problems in the prefrontal systems that are important for attention. So I don't, I don't know of uh, any good data about what happens. Um, I, I can tell you that as we get older, even without dementia, attending can become hard. Um, for questions, we have a microphone so okay. that the whole room can hear it. Um, who is next? <laughs> you put it over there. Uh, here, Casey, you can take the microphone over there. Why don't we have this gentleman in the front, right here, in the brown jacket? Yeah, I have two questions. Um, with this particular work on hyperfocusing, I wondered how it applied to attention deficit disorder. And the other question relates back to your original video. Uh, based on the response to people missing all the signals. I wonder why eyewitnesses are considered the most reliable evidence in a court of law versus other evidence. Okay, those are two very good questions. So the first question is essentially, what about attention deficit disorder? So attention deficit disorder seems to be largely driven by an inability to maintain your focus over time on the things that are hard to attend to. So people with attention deficit disorder, it's not that they can't focus, 
Um, oftentimes what parents of, of children with ADHD will report is they'll sit there and play a video game like crazy and nothing else like gets in. What they have trouble with is when they have to focus on the thing that doesn't naturally attract their attention. And I don't, uh, I don't yet have a neurobiological explanation for that, but that the circuit here, there are really two ways to disrupt it. And I have a hunch that schizophrenia and ADHD disrupt it in opposite directions. But that's just a hunch at this point. Now, eyewitness testimony, that has been very extensively studied and people are not very reliable. So why it is used extensively in the court of law? That's a historical question, but there's a lot of good reason to believe that people oftentimes misremember things. So for example, if you are involved in a crime where somebody has a gun, you will hyper-focus on that gun and you'll remember hardly anything else. So eyewitness testimony very tricky thing and there are a lot of people who have been falsely convicted on the basis of people saying I am sure that it was that person and then 10 years later DNA testing shows that it wasn't that person okay next question let's see why don't we do the hello I'm not sure if you uh, answer this question uh, Parkinson's uh, talk a little funny but it's not, well, that's not my question. My question is, um, I'm actually a, a counselor, and we have, as as we, have, we have group counseling, and one thing we've debated is how many people can, can, you, can you see in a room? So like, I would say that if there's 100 people in the room, you can't see 100 people. If there's two people in the room, you can see two people. Yeah, someone told me at once, they said, they thought eight was the maximum you could see. Uh, I don't, is, there, is there a set number of people you can see? Does that make sense? Is there, uh, how, so that's my question, is what's, what's the maximum number you can see the average person? Thank right, you. so the question is, if you're looking out in a room of people, can you actually see all of those people as individuals? If, you see, if you're looking at one person, you can see the one person. If there's two, you can see there's two. But at what point do you get beyond your limit? And again, there are individual differences in this, but the limit seems to be somewhere between about four and seven. That once you get beyond that limit of somewhere between four and seven, you just sort of see a blurry crowd of people and you lose the ability to individuate the people. So when, when I look out into this room, if I had enough training, I'd be able to estimate how many people there were, but it would just be an estimate. But if you give me five, even if it, I can see them only briefly, I look at them, I look away, I can probably tell you that there were five very accurately. But above six or seven, I'm just gonna say it was a bunch. <laughs> Go ahead. Is, is the focus of, of young people today on things like video gaming and, and other sort of screen-based interactive uh, ways of relating to the world around them, is that improving their working memory? That's a good question, because people often ask, you know, are video games and the internet killing kids' brains? And the answer does not seem to be that it's, that it's the problem that a lot of people were worried about. Um, in fact, playing a particular kind of video game, the sort of first person active shooter games, actually increases a bunch of visual abilities. It doesn't increase your working memory capacity, which has been, you know, one question I love to answer is, how can we make our working memory capacity bigger and therefore be smarter? A lot of people have been looking at that. We don't have a way of doing that yet. However, playing those action video games allows you to see a broader, over a broader range at the same time, which is important for things like driving, so you have good peripheral vision. Now, video games also do have a downside, and the downside is mainly that they sort of amp up the reward system of the brain, and that can lead to problematic behaviors and that sort of thing. Okay, next question. Sure. How about? Hi, um, this deals with the working memory part of your talk. Um, the, the first couple tasks, the adding the numbers and the comparing the two scenes, uh, at least for me, I did it in a very conscious way. And then when you did the colored squares, um, well, with four, I got it right. But I couldn't tell you how I did it. I couldn't name any of the colors. It seemed to be a completely unconscious process. Are those different things going on? 
Well, consciousness is incredibly difficult to objectively test. Um, if we do the tests that we can do, it seems that working memory is generally associated with being conscious of the information. Uh, you might not be conscious of how you're doing it, but if we present a stimulus that you're not conscious of, and there are ways of doing that, we don't usually see any working memory encoding. So you might not have felt like you knew how you were doing the task, but you probably still had some awareness of the colors that we could get at if we tested you appropriately. Do we have time for one more question? Or OK, why don't you go ahead and pass the mic down? So uh, you, you said that competition sometimes allows us to focus better. Do we have like a set point at which there's too much competition, and is there a physiological change that we can measure? Yeah, that's a good question, and I don't know of any research that answers it. So, but I'm going to write it down, and I'll go to the lab, and maybe next year I'll have the answer, because it's a really good question. Okay, we have to move on to our next speaker, but thank you all for your attention and your great questions. <laughs>